All right. I will be talking more about valve hemodynamics. I will mostly show cases with hemodynamic tracings, okay? So this is a tracing I very much like. It's one of my favorite tracings. This is a right atrial pressure. And look at it and try to think what's the diagnosis. And to help you here, always when you look at at tracing, the easy thing to look at, it's what's the number, is it high or not? That's the easy thing. But then the second and more important thing is to analyze the waveform morphology and see what this is consistent with. So yes, as uh, Vikram answered, this is consistent with severe tricuspid regurgitation. I want you to recognize this morphology that we call ventricularized right atrial pressure. It's basically a right atrial pressure that looks like a ventricular pressure. So we have A and V wave, but the V wave is not narrow and peaked, like I described happens with severe mitral regurgitation on the left for the LA pressure. It's wide and plateaued. It's like a ventricular pressure. It peaks throughout systole, throughout the T wave. And when you see this, this is pathognomonic for severe TR, sometimes torrential TR. So recognize this pattern. I will show more cases. This is a patient with um, this is a patient with a history of mechanical mitral valve replacement one, one year prior who presents with a severe heart failure picture. Both the echo and the MRI suggest mild tricuspid regurgitation. And they suggest that the mitral valve appears well seated with no significant mitral regurgitation. We then did a hemodynamic study after echo and MRI. And I'm going to show you the right atrial pressure and the wedge pressure here. So this is the right atrial pressure. Okay, again, mild TR on echo and, and MRI. So this is right atrial pressure. Look at this, it's one, it's super high. Look at that V wave, it almost reaches 50 millimeter of mercury. That's as high, again, this is right atrial pressure, not wedge pressure. This is as high of a right atrial pressure as you will ever see. Imagine right atrial pressure, V wave almost 50. It's almost as high as a PA pressure, uh, you know, in a patient with pulmonary hypertension. So, so it's very high, but it's also plateaued. Look at that V wave. It's plateaued throughout the T. It's not peaking after T, it's throughout the T. This is a classic ventricularized right atrial waveform. Again, 100% this patient has severe torrential, torrential tricuspid regurgitation that was missed by both echo and MRI. And I can explain why it was missed. Another thing to note on this tracing, and I want you to always recognize that, Whenever you have a big V wave and a severe regurgitation or decompensated failure causing big V wave, whether on the left or the right, your X becomes flat most often and your Y descent becomes deep. So that big V wave pulls up the X descent and it is followed by a deep Y. Okay, as, as soon as that atrium empties in the ventricle, you get an all of a sudden an abrupt drop in pressure. So flat X, deep Y go hand in hand with a big V wave. So this slide shows you this. I did a simultaneous recording of the right atrial pressure and the RV pressure. And this is as good of a ventricularized right atrial pressure as you will ever see. I mean, they are almost superimposed, the right atrial pressure, which is the one in yellow, and the right ventricular pressure in green. So as soon as systole starts, the right ventricular pressure, the right ventricle regurgitates so much, so widely into the right atrium that they almost become a common chamber with almost similar pressure. And now that can explain to you why you're not going to see it by echo and MRI. That very tracing explains the issue with the MRI. And by the way, normally, normally, as I've explained in prior lecture, V wave is bisected by the descent. 
So it doesn't peak, it's not plateaued throughout systole normally. That V wave should be somewhere here. It should be bisected. It should be peaked and bisected. Narrow, sorry. It should be narrow and bisected by the RV descent. Whereas here it's plateaued parallel to the RV. Uh, here I want to show you this idea. So this is the echo of this patient, okay? Um, the four chamber view and you're seeing the TR. When your RA and RV are almost equal, one, there isn't much of a pressure difference. So you're not going to have a high velocity. You're not going to have aliasing for your TR and you're not going to have turbulence. You're not going to exceed aliasing. You're not going to have turbulence. So that's one thing. So your flow becomes laminar and it's hard for your eye to catch it. It's just that blue flame that you see sometimes in very early systole. Now, the blue flame. So that's one. Two, it's very brief because they equalize so quickly. You may only see it in early systole. I don't know if I have, no. So that's the idea why echo will very much underestimate it because you barely get any regurgitant flow. They equalize very quickly and it's not high velocity. Uh, so keep that in mind you have to have a high index of suspicion by exam and the cath will help more in those cases than echo and even MRI. So on, the, on that same patient, remember I mentioned he has um, a mechanical mitral valve a year prior. So we did wedge pressure and look at that wedge pressure. What does it suggest? So this is the wedge again, A and V. And look at that V wave, it's over 70 millimeter of mercury. So in someone with a recent uh, or, or with any uh, mechanical mitral valve, what does this big V wave suggest? What's the diagnosis? Severe MR. Severe MR, well, what's the explanation? So good, it's severe torrential mitral regurgitation. Again, missed by- Either, hmm? either like uh, dehiscence or paravalvular leak. Excellent, excellent, yes. Good answer. If this was a bioprosthetic valve, one can think of structural deterioration of the valve causing a leak, usually not a year later though. But when it's a mechanical a mitral valve, the current generation of valves, they don't get structural deterioration. The only thing that could explain this is a massive paravalvular leak. And a massive paravalvular leak that exceeds 30, 40% of the valve circumference will actually be um, a valve dehiscence. That's what valve dehiscence is. It's the same as more than 30, 40% paravalvular leak. And that's exactly what the diagnosis is here. And we confirm it. What's one simple way to confirm it in the cath lab? While we're doing this, although we weren't planning on doing one thing, we did it as after seeing that tracing. It's a fluoroscopy uh, of the valve. No, it's a fluoroscopy of the valve. Yes, you can do ventriculogram as well. That's a good idea but just a fluoroscopy of the valve with no contrast of the mechanical valve, you'll see what we call a rocking movement of that annulus of the valve, okay? You'll see it shaking up and down. Whenever you see that, that's a sign of extreme paravalvular leak. And that's what we saw in this case. So massive V wave from massive uh, paravalvular mitral leak. And here I'm showing simultaneous RA wedge pressure, just to show you that both have very high V wave. But interestingly, on the left, even when you get massive V wave, you don't usually get that ventricularized morphology. V wave on the left remains always narrow peaked and still peaks late after the T wave. It doesn't become simultaneous to systole. It's hard on the left to get a ventricular shape simply because it's hard on the left for the left atrial pressure to equalize with the higher left ventricular pressure, okay? And uh, I want to show uh, here another idea here and regarding this, tra regarding tricuspid regurgitation. So I mentioned how echo and MRI missed it. Cath was very useful, but also exam is very useful. This is a case where physical exam is more helpful actually than echo and MRI. 
And this is what you see in this patient. This is from a patient I had a few months ago. So you see the JV jugular, external jugular vein distended, and it's pulsating like a carotid. Normally, the jugular vein has minor pulsations, A and V. They are not plateaued, and V peaks after the carotid pulse, just after the carotid pulse. When you have a big jugular venous pulsation that peaks throughout systole, and it looks like a carotid pulse, it peaks throughout systole like a carotid pulse, or what I would call arterialized jugular venous pressure, which is also ventricularized jugular venous pressure. This is pathognomonic for severe tricuspid regurgitation. You see this again, it pulsates like a pulse, not like a V wave. And this is severe tricuspid regurgitation. Another physical exam finding that's also pathognomonic for that, although um, a little harder to elicit in, in my experience is the pulsatile hepatomegaly. So those two, pulsatile hepatomegaly and arterialized JVP are pathognomonic for severe TR and can help you even when echo does not. This is another case, again, I had in the uh, MICU a few, uh, a couple of months ago. So this is a patient, uh, young, relatively young and healthy 60 year old man who had a motor vehicle accident and chest trauma. He's in shock. And this is a swan that was placed in him. And this is a screenshot from the ICU. So this is his PA pressure in yellow. Okay, it's not high. Maybe the systolic PA pressure is about 35 millimeter of mercury, upper limit. And this is the CVP or JVP. Look at that. So that alone made the diagnosis. His echo was done, and echo showed severely enlarged right ventricle, uh, but no tricuspid regurgitation. Now, when I look at this, I see that the CVP is high, you know, it's the mean is about 15, but more importantly, I see that morphology. What does this morphology tell me again? The same as prior cases. I want your eyes to get used to this. This JVP has a V wave that's speaking, you know, almost simultaneously to the PA pressure. Yes, the CVP peak is off the scale, but nonetheless, it, it has a ventricularized morphology. This is the one I captured, but we have it. We changed the scale and it does have a ventricularized plateaued morphology. So that tracing alone suggested to us that he has severe TR that is underestimated by echo again. You're more likely to underestimate those TR by echo when the RV pressure is not high because that RA pressure doesn't just ventricularize, it really fully equalizes with the RV systolic pressure. So you get very minimal color Doppler. The case I showed earlier though, the RV pressure was high, yet you still had almost equalization of RA and RV and you could not see much on echo. This case though is easier to equalize uh, here, sorry. This one, because the RV pressure and the PA systolic pressure is not high, okay? So uh, again, this is the echo of this patient. So again, like the case I showed earlier, this is in the short axis aortic view, but anyway, you see barely, at times you see a laminar blue flow, very brief, that's your TR, that laminar brief blue flow. No aliasing, no turbulence, and it's brief. Uh, and if you put the spectral Doppler, again, you see not much of a difference in pressure between RA and RV, and it's also brief, that regurgitant um, volume. Uh, again, the same thing I showed earlier. Did everybody understand this concept? Now, why did he have severe TR? Good point. So whenever you see that in a trauma patient, your immediate reflex would be, well, he must have had a rupture of the subvalvular or valvular apparatus of the tricuspid valve. Um, and for that reason, we did a TEE on this patient because that is a possibility, traumatic rupture. Uh, however, the, the 
tricuspid valve was uh, structurally competent, it was structurally intact. And the reason he had severe TR was that massive RV dilatation. So this patient got RV contusion from trauma, RV dilatation, and functional TR from RV dilatation. Uh, not so much of a tricuspid valve rupture, but at least this gave us a level, level of alertness to look for uh, traumatic rupture of the tricuspid apparatus. Okay, good point. This is another case, again, very interesting to me. So this is a 64 year old uh, lady. She has a left, she had a left atrial myxoma excision in 2009. She doesn't have other comorbidities. She's having dyspnea on heavy exertion, uh, long walk, heavy pushing, unusual for her. Her echo is unremarkable. It was read as normal. And we did write her cath and all the numbers, if you look at uh, the cath report numbers, they are all normal, perfectly normal. But there is something and that shows the important at looking at morphology. But this is the right atrial pressure waveform. So even though the mean is normal, it's five, the morphology is, I think, is strikingly abnormal. I hope, of course, now you all see, this is like I showed in all the prior cases, this is a ventricularized RA pressure. You know that RA pressure, again, peaks throughout systole and it looks like a ventricular pressure, plateau, rectangular, V wave, with a normal mean. So that alone gave us a diagnosis. So it gave us a diagnosis of, you know, severe TR that was again, overlooked by echo, but there is something else. I mean, what kind of severe TR? What's the cause of her TR? If, you, if one wants to speculate. Is it functional TR or is it a primary structural damage TR? The idea here I want to bring is when you have functional TR, by definition, your RA pressure, the mean RA pressure should be elevated, okay? Functional severe TR that leads to ventricularized RA pressure is by definition related to severe RV failure and thus must be associate, associated with elevated RA pressure. RA pressure may improve with diuresis and functional TR, but at that time, they are, the uh, TR itself will improve and the RA morphology will improve as well. So functional severe TR, if you have this morphology, your RA pressure should be high. The only diagnosis here, in my opinion, is primary TR from structural valvular damage, okay? That's the only case, and it's at a stage where the RV has not failed yet. So the RA pressure is normal in mean, but the morphology is ventricularized from the TR and the RV has not failed yet. So it's possibly a, a structural TR related to damage during the valve surgery uh, that progressed over time uh, or damage from the early myxoma. Hard to tell. Uh, this lady, um, had an MRI, it did not show damage. It did confirm some degree, at least MRI showed moderate to severe TR, and she's awaiting TEE to further uh, elucidate the diagnosis on her. You see? Yes, to define large V wave, like we do on the left, for the right, it's a V wave that is five millimeter larger than the mean. On the left, it's V wave 10 millimeter or more larger than the mean. On the right, it's a V wave five millimeter or more larger than the mean. Plus take into account the morphology on the right. If it is ventricularized and it really doesn't matter. This is a large ventricularized V wave. Any other questions? If no questions, I will move to a totally different topic. So this is a simple pullback, uh, not even a clean one and not a fancy one, but it was good enough to give a diagnosis in this patient. This is a, again, I'm switching gears here. This is an LV to aorta pullback, uh, a routine one, but it gave us a diagnosis here. What's the diagnosis based on that pullback? 
So LV aorta. Yes, good answer. So here is what I want you to know. Always when you analyze tracing and waveform, especially when you're analyzing simultaneous tracing or you're comparing ventricle to aorta or ventricle to arterial or ventricle to atrium, always compare systole, assess systole and diastole. So in this simple pullback, analyze systole. Okay, there is no gradient. So there is no AS or LVOT obstruction. But don't forget to analyze diastole. People forget that. Well, when you look in diastole, look at that. The aortic diastolic pressure is 40 millimeter of mercury. You have wide pulse pressure with a low aortic diastolic pressure of 40. And look at the LV diastolic pressure, especially after a PV, especially after a pause. It's almost 40. So you have near equalization of aortic diastolic pressure and LVEDP. This is pathognomonic for severe decompensated aortic insufficiency, where the aortic diastolic pressure and LV diastolic pressure meet, okay? So that trace simple and even ugly unclean tracing gave us, gave us a diagnosis of severe AI. Another thing, you have white pulse pressure. And here I want you just to tell you the definition of white pulse pressure. It's, Pulse pressure, that's over half of systolic blood pressure. That's one of the definition, but that's the better one. Pulse pressure over half of the systolic blood pressure, okay? Another thing you see on this tracing, there is no dichrotic notch, even though the pressure is fairly well damped. You know, you see a wave, you see an anachrotic notch, but you see no dichrotic notch. So that's another thing that you see in AI. You can see in AI, absent dichrotic notch. Now you see somewhat pronounced anachrotic notch without, he doesn't have aortic stenosis. As we discussed last time, you know, anachrotic notch suggests aortic stenosis, but this patient has no aortic stenosis. The reason we see anachrotic notch and anachrotic notch can be seen in aortic insufficiency, even without aortic stenosis, is because of the high flow that crosses the aortic valve in AI the aortic valve may become functionally obstructive. And that can create that flow limitation across the aortic valve, even if it is not uh, anatomically stenotic, okay? The difference though is that that anachrotic notch is very, very high on the upslope, unlike AS where the anachrotic notch is low and the pulses is tardis and narrow. That's not the case here. It's a sharp upslope and it's a wide pulse pressure. So it's the anachrotic notch of AI. So a lot of information from this tracing. This is a standard picture I show all the time. And basically this is what you get. This is a triangle of death on simultaneous aortic LV pressure in diastole. Aortic diastolic pressure meets the LV diastolic pressure or comes close to it within 30 millimeter mercury of it. So it doesn't have to touch it, but if it is close to it, the difference is less than 30 millimeter of mercury, that's suggestive of severe decompensated AI at a stage where the LV compliance is overwhelmed and the LVDP shoots up and equalizes with the aortic diastolic pressure. In compensated chronic severe AI, the LV is compliant and the LVDP does not meet the aortic diastolic pressure. There may be a large distance between them. Also in compensated AI, this is when you get that big pulse pressure that, and those classic peripheral uh, bounding pulse signs. Because in that case, also your LV has enlarged to be able to pump more and that creates the biggest, biggest initial stroke volume with a very large pulse pressure. So that large pulse pressure is an indicator of mostly chronic severe AI. You can see it in acute AI, but it's, not very large, it's mostly a low diastolic pressure, not a large systolic pressure. So the widest pulse pressure is in chronic AI and those classic signs, uh, peripheral pulse signs of AI are chronic AI signs. Uh, another thing I want to highlight is when you get that triangle of death, it's not just indicative of AI, you have to think, how is the coronary perfusion in that case? 
keep in mind what's the pressure gradient that drives coronary perfusion. Coronary perfusion happens mostly in diastole. And this is what drives the coronary perfusion, the difference between diastolic aortic pressure and the LV diastolic pressure. And whenever the gradient between aortic and LV diastolic pressure is less than 30, 40 millimeter of mercury, when that difference is less than 30, 40 millimeter of mercury, your coronary flow is severely impaired. You need 30, 40 millimeter of mercury to overcome the microvascular resistance. So when you see that, it's not just a sign of severe AI that will be severely symptomatic from low flow state, uh, low effective flow state, it will be also it will also cause a severe uh, myocardial ischemia. Those are patients who get myocardial ischemia, particularly at night, when your heart becomes slow, that aorta and LV get more of a chance to meet and you get less coronary flow with the bradycardia in those patients and you get more ischemia. That's why nocturnal angina uh, can be a sign of severe AI. Did everybody understand those concepts here? If you don't have, please ask or write them in the chat box. This is another uh, pressure tracing that I like. Again, this is LV pressure and aortic pressure, simultaneous recording. Again, learn to practice to analyze both systole and diastole. Now, this is a more beautiful tracing because we can have problems in both systole and diastole. So what do you think this patient has? Does he have aortic insufficiency? Yes, correct answer, Vikram. Vikram is the superstar today. So uh, yes, so one in, let's add, I'll start with diastole here. So in diastole, uh, for one, you notice that, that aortic pressure, aortic pulse pressure is wide. I mean, look at the systolic pressure is 150 and the diastolic aortic pressure is maybe 45. So you have a really wide pulse pressure. You have no dicrotic notch. So those are already two signs of aortic insufficiency. And you have this approximation of aortic diastolic pressure with LV and diastolic pressure. The difference is less than 30. Here, the LV and diastolic pressure is about, this is the scale, it's about maybe 30 millimeter of mercury, and this is 45. So it's really approximation of, they don't have to touch, they just approximate. And that's again, very, uh, you know, consistent with severe decompensated AI. So this patient has severe decompensated AI hemodynamically. Now you look in systole, he has, okay, the peak systolic aortic pressure is about 150 and the LV systolic pressure is about 190. So he has a peak to peak gradient of about 40 millimeter of mercury. So is this severe AS? I think this patient definitely has severe AI, but is this the severe AS? Note also he has anacrotic notch. Like I said, it's somewhat high on the upslope and the pulses is not tardus. So that anacrotic notch is more of an AI anacrotic notch than an AS anacrotic notch. So that doesn't help me too much. It does confirm he has severe aortic valve disease. Doesn't distinguish which one though. Uh, does he have severe AS? I'll give you the practical answer. It doesn't matter. That aortic valve needs to be replaced. He, he is in a decompensated aortic valve uh, disease state uh, with severe decompensated AI. So it really doesn't matter. But for a uh, philosophical discussion, he does have AS, but that AS is not severe, very likely. It's probably more in the mild to moderate range. Yes, like Ahmed explained. So. It's AS that is exaggerated by the high flow crossing the aortic valve. Keep in mind that this, for the same aortic valve area, the pressure gradient 
is exaggerated by flow. Pressure gradient, like I explained several times, is very much dependent on flow. This is the equation. You need to re remember it. This is the Gordon equation. Valve area equal valve flow divided by square root of pressure gradient. You flip it around. Pressure gradient approximate flow square divided by valve area square. So I want this equation to be implanted in your brains. That's why I keep repeating it. So flow square. So if you have somebody with a double flow, you can quadruple the pressure gradient. So in AI, the flow that's crossing, let's say your systemic cardiac output is five liters per minute. Well, the flow crossing the aortic valve is at least 10 liters per minute because half of it goes backward. So you have at, at least 10 liters per minute crossing the aortic valve. So you have a dramatic increase in flow across the aortic valve and that will exaggerate the pressure gradient across the aortic valve and will cause an exaggeration of the severity of AS. So 40 millimeter of mercury in this case is not severe AS, it's probably mild to moderate, but again, honestly, it makes no difference. Uh, like I explained in the past, even if it is moderate, with moderate AI, it doesn't have to be even severe, mixed, moderate AS, moderate AI, causing a gradient 40 millimeter or more, that qualifies for valve surgery. That's the only mixed moderate, or that's the only moderate disease that qualifies for surgery. Moderate AS, moderate AI would qualify you for aortic valve replacement, class one in the guidelines. Okay. Hope everybody understood that. If you have a question, please ask. I will show another sign of AI. Uh, those were hemodynamic signs, but I will show an, show an angiographic, coronary angiographic sign that's very interesting in a patient with AI. So this patient, uh, this is from another patient with AI. This patient has actually bioprosthetic AI degenerated a bioprosthetic valve with AI. But he has that angiographic sign that I want you to look at. So look at this coronary angiogram. The patient has no obstructive CAD. Look here, what do you see? Is there like diastolic uh, reversal of the flow in the coronaries? Excellent, excellent answer. Yes. So first, when you look at it, it looks initially like bridging. It's milking of that artery. In one part of the cardiac cycle, it constricts, and it opens up in another part of the cardiac cycle. My, my immediate reflex is um, you know, bridging, myocardial bridging. But then you think this patient has AI. And if you time it properly, you see that that milking occurs in end diastole. At the end of the heart relaxation is when you see it. See that? As the, at the end of relaxation, you see that constriction. So this is end diastolic coronary milking. This is actually, as Ahmed described, this is consistent with the reversal of flow. The same thing you see on echo, diastolic reversal of flow, holodiastolic reversal of uh, aortic flow. Uh, in AI, you see it in the coronary. This is diastolic flow reversal. So, uh, you know, it creates that milking in end diastole. You have less blood in end diastole. Flow is going back. And you see it more in the distal coronary angiographically. Uh, we don't just see it in the LED. We saw it also in the PLB branch. Look at this here. You see it? I want you to focus there on the PLB. And you, again, you see that end diastolic milking as the heart is at the end of its relaxation, uh, re relaxation is being made, okay? Uh, and that's kind of um, what you see here. We could have also, you know, we don't need to prove it. We could have done an aortic angiogram here to prove AI furthermore, prove AI, but we don't need to prove it here. This was AI from valve degeneration, not paravalvular in this patient. If everybody understand that, I'm going to show another sign of AI, which is this. Uh, you have to be astute when you're doing those cases, when you're pulling, when you're removing the catheter from the aorta to whether the femoral artery or your radial artery, just be aware of recording that pullback, okay? It's nothing fancy. Uh, 
sorry, it's nothing fancy. So, and here is what you see if you pull back. Not always, but you can see it. Normally, when you pull back in a normal individual from the aorta to the radial artery, you will get some amplification of the systolic pressure. It is usually less than 20, 30 millimeter of mercury. The more young and healthy you are, the more you see that peripheral systolic amplification. But in AI, you get exaggeration of this normal phenomenon. So the pressure, this is the aortic pressure, and this is the radial artery. The radial systolic pressure here is exceeding 200 millimeter of mercury, while the aortic systolic pressure is only 120. So uh, that's one phenomena. Another phenomena you see in the peripheral arteries in AI is what you call the pulses bisferians. So let me explain those. So, so one, I identify it. It's an exaggeration between aortic pressure to radial artery of over 40, especially over 60 millimeter of mercury in systole. That's very much consistent with AI, and it used to be called by physical exam, uh, the hill sign. Why does this happen? You get a big initial stroke volume in AI, and when that initial stroke volume, that big one before it regurgitates back, hits the peripheral uh, muscular non-compliant arteries, you get a bigger uh, leap in pressure because of the non-compliance of the peripheral arteries. So this is what explains that amplified systolic pressure. Now, after you get that initial thump, you get aftershock reverberated waves that create a second percussion wave. And uh, that's, we call it, sorry, tidal wave, a second tidal wave, aftershock wave. And this is what creates that morphology of pulses bisferians, initial systolic amplification and the secondary aftershock wave pulses bisferians, all this before the diacritic notch, okay? You don't always see that, but when you see it, it's very suggestive of AI in cases that are questionable. All right, uh, so did everybody understand that? Okay. And this is a summary of the four hemodynamic findings of AI, the widened pulse pressure, the absent diacritic notch, the approximation of LVDP and aortic diastolic pressure, and the peripheral systolic amplification, uh, along with the pulses bisferians. Everybody understood that? I want to show here quickly this slide of the aortic morphologies, uh, since uh, you know that I've described in this and prior talks. So try in your brain to identify each one of the following four. This aortic morphology, this, this, and that. And let's consider those um, peripheral arteries, not aorta. So I'm going to give for the, um, in order to save time, I'm going to give the answer, but I hope you all recognize those. What is this A? Anybody tell me what, what's the diagnosis in A? Aortic stenosis. Excellent, aortic stenosis. So we see a low anacrotic notch, late peaking, the tardis, the pulse is tardis, late peaking pulse with a slow upslope after that anacrotic notch, and it's a narrow pulse pressure. So severe aortic stenosis. What is this arterial tracing? Beside Ahmed, someone else. This is what I just described. I hope you all recognize it. It's the same. It's this. This is the pulses bisferians of aortic insufficiency. Plus, yes, plus it's a very wide pulse pressure. So pulses bisferians, very wide pulse pressure. Now, what is this one? Vikram already answered it. Yes, this is a spike and dome of Hocum. Remember in uh, dynamic LVOT obstruction, your obstruction is worse in end systole. You know, you start with a sharp upslope, then you get late peaking of the gradient, late obstruction with a late gradient and dagger shaped LV that will be here peaking late with a drop in late drop in aortic pressure, the spike and dome. How about D? That's a more difficult one. Is it subvalvular stenosis? No, 
Subvalvular stenosis will either will either give you this if it is um, dynamic, like hokum, or will give you this actually if it is non-dynamic, if it is from a membrane. This is something else I want you to look that big. So you have systolic pressure and that big thing here, that big wave is actually diastolic wave. Unlike here, where both waves are systolic in pulses bisferians are both systolic. This is here a big pronounced dicrotic notch. We call it dicrotic wave. This is pathognomonic for this phenomena. It's what we call severe advanced heart failure with a very low cardiac output. This gives you a big dicrotic notch. And you will see along with that other findings. So for one, you see, look at that very narrow pulse pressure. And as opposed to AI, your pulse pressure is, you know, it's almost 120 over 95. So very narrow pulse pressure that you see in advanced heart failure, low output heart failure. You also see another sign of low output. So you see narrow pulse pressure. You see that big dicrotic notch, which is also a sign of low output. You see another sign of low output here. Pulses alternance. Yes, pulses alternance. Exactly. So those are, those are three findings of advanced low output heart failure. I'll explain to you why you get that big dicrotic uh, notch. Uh, the dicrotic notch corresponds in general to the rebound of the arterial pressure from that continuous elastic recoil of the arterial tree and from the mas muscular tone of the peripheral small vessels. Okay, so in patient with a low output from heart failure, but even sometimes from hypovolemia, you'll get severe vasoconstriction and that will create an extra thump in early diastole. It, create a, it will create a prominent dicrotic notch that becomes like, like a wave. And that's what's um, called the dicrotic pulse. So it's due to peripheral systemic severe vasoconstriction. Okay. And it's particularly pronounced when you compare it to a narrow pulse pressure, which again corresponds to low output state. Did everybody understood understood those uh, those waveforms? So I will give, if no questions, I will give one more thing, and uh, before I have to stop here, I will give quickly this. This is a rare but very interesting finding here. This is a PA pressure. I want you, I explained to you in the past, if there's one thing you need to recognize when you look at the tracing is an arterial tracing, how it looks compared to ventricular and atrial. Arterial tracing, as I explained, is always down sloping in diastole with a dicrotic notch, but it's down sloping in diastole. Look at any arterial tracing you want. It's down sloping in diastole, whereas atrial, and LV are upsloping. That's the first thing you look at. When you look at tracing and you don't know what it is, look in diastole to identify whether it's arterial or not. That's how actually in the cath lab, we can tell we're ventricularized. When, when our guide pressure goes from something like this to something like that, that's ventricularized pressure. So very basic concept. Yet here we put our catheter in the PA and this is what we obtained it looks like a ventricular pressure. That PA looks like an RV. It is upsloping in diastole with an A wave. It doesn't look like a PA. And we were truly, of course, when you see that, you will imagine, oh, I'm not in the PA. I'm still maybe in the RVOT and I think I'm in the PA. But we were indeed in the PA here. We were able to wedge it, actually. We were able to get wedge pressure. So this is a truly a PA pressure, but it looks like an RV. This is rare, okay, this is rare. This is not like ventricularized right atrial pressure. Ventricularized PA pressure is rare. But when you see it, it's very suggestive of one diagnosis. Anybody can tell what's the diagnosis? Excellent, Vikram. It's pulmonic insufficiency, regurgitation. So I did in this patient simultaneous RVPA measurement to prove the concept. And so this is your PA in blue, and this is the RV in red. 
So he has a little bit of pulmonic stenosis as well. There is a gradient between the RV and the PA. But more importantly in diastole, look at this. I mean, the RV, the PA pressure in diastole is very superimposed to the PA pressure. Uh, the, sorry, the PA pressure is very superimposed to the RV pressure. It's basically this patient has wide open pulmonic regurgitation, so much so that the PA pressure rapidly equalizes with the RV pressure in early diastole, and so much so that the PA and RV become like one compartment, as if you have no uh, pulmonic valve. The PA pressure becomes ventricularized, and actually RV ejection in the PA starts in diastole. Again, it's like one compartment. You have no pulmonic valve when the RV uh, the, the RV, you know, moves into the PA even in diastole as the RV is filling from the RA, it's pumping it in diastole in the PA. And you can imagine the biggest caveat here, this patient by echo and MRI, they could not tell that PI is severe. I'll give you more info on that patient. That patient has carcinoid heart disease. He has severe tricuspid regurgitation that was identified on echo but they could not identify severe pulmonic regurgitation, neither by echo uh, nor by uh, MRI. And you can see here, the reason again, the same thing I had explained in severe TR, whenever you have that approximation of pressure, echo becomes very limited. Again, because there isn't much pressure gradient, therefore the velocity between the uh, PA and the RV is limited. So you'll have a laminar flow, uh, and it will be brief. It will be just here in early diastole. So it will be brief and limited in color and limited in velocity because there is no pressure gradient. You have common chamber phenomena. The same phenomena that happens between RV and RA in severe TR is what we call common chamber phenomena. Echo becomes very limited in this case. Again, you can only see flame of blue at one point in early diastole. That flame of blue is your PR. By the way, one echo point here. I've been taught by uh, one of the best uh, echocardiographers that in, if you want to assess echocardiographically pulmonary regurgitation, that's the only valvular disease where you need to have your sector large. So this is a technical mistake here. That sector needs to be large and you will need to see that blue laminar flame you will see it going all the way deep in the right ventricle, even all the way into the RV inflow. So when you see a laminar flow going all the way deep in the inflow, that suggests severe PI. Frequently, those primary pulmonic insufficiency, they don't have high velocity. There isn't much gradient between uh, PA and RV in the asteroid. So the only way of telling is to see that laminar flow going deep. So the length of the laminar flow is diagnostic of severe PI echocardiographically not the area, not the size, not the aliasing, okay?